I'm sure many, if not all of us here, are familiar with Murray's writings and his pronouncements. And today we're very pleased to have Murray talk to us on the founding of the Federal Reserve. So without further ado, I present Professor Murray Rothbard. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, there, was a, there was a statement, um, I think uh, somebody asked Professor Peden earlier, um, what uh, was this naivete about the part of, on the part of the people advocating inflation? And uh, <clears throat> he answered, uh, basically, people tend to seem to be naive in their own self-interest. And uh, this is very relevant to what I'm talking about today, namely the origin of the Federal Reserve System. The, um, the orthodox view, so to speak, or the mainstream view of the history of the Federal Reserve System is very similar to the mainstream view of the history of <clears throat> all government regulation, progressive institutions, so, so, so called, um, history of the public school system, all the, all the histories written before about 1960. Uh, <clears throat> essentially, it's an exercise in hagiography, hey uh, which is, those of you not familiar with theology, is the, uh, the history of the lives of the saints. Um, heroic, uh, enlightened people in some, you know, some county, in Zilch County, North Dakota, or whatever, uh, decide there should be public schools, and they agitate for it, and backward types who don't want to pay more taxes are against it, and finally the, uh, the enlightened people win out. And it's that sort of approach um, in progressive regulation. It's things, uh, things like uh, those who want to, uh, those who, who think that we shouldn't have diseased meat agitate for it, um, and finally they went out over narrow, selfish businessmen who were against, against the uh, meat control regulation. Uh, so that sort, of, that sort of approach to the history of <laughs> regulation is uh, naive and biased at best. <clears throat> it turns out in the last 20 years or so, historians have revised this whole picture of the history of government regulation in the, in the United States. The, um, and the same thing goes for the history of the, uh, of the Federal Reserve, founding of the Federal Reserve System. The thing, one thing we have to realize in the first place is that, um, is that the um, Federal Reserve Act was a part of the progressive era, part of the progressive package, of so-called progressive uh, legislation, which started around 1900 and uh, continued on until through World War I. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the... Uh, and if we realize that the nature of the progressive movement and progressive uh, progressivism uh, was not simply uh, we discover enlightenment, we, we realize the public good requires that untrammeled businessmen be uh, regulated for the, made to serve the public interest and that sort of stuff. If we realize that the, the, whole, the whole history is totally different, then we can, we're more apt to have a, a better picture uh, of the founding of the Federal Reserve System. <clears throat> the, uh, basically, the, uh, the insight into the history of the progressive era uh, can be related to something like this. For example, when, when, a, when, a, when tariffs go up, when the steel industry, well, let's put it this way, let's say the government institutes a higher tariff on steel, which is it's doing most of the time anyway, uh, since about 1820. <laughs> when the government institutes a higher tariff on steel or import quotas on steel, nobody really thinks that this is done because of uh, far-sighted, uh, enlightened people think we, we really need it, and uh, therefore we come in and, we, and they, they persuade businessmen to go along with it and persuade the government to go along with it. Nobody really believes that. Everybody realizes that if the steel, industry, if the steel tariff goes up, it's probably because the steel industry is agitated for it. Okay? And, if you, and then if you check on this hypothesis, you'll find, of course, that's exactly what happened. Uh, not every person in the steel industry, but basically the steel industrialists, realizing that they're inefficient being outcompeted by foreign steel, uh, decide to agitate for a higher tariff. <clears throat> so in things like tariffs, uh, this is common practice. You're not called an economic determinist or a Marxist if you, if you make the statement that uh, uh, tariff went up because of the, you know, industrialists in, this, in that particular industry agitated for it. And yet for, for anything else, this somehow becomes a, a no-no or verboten kind of proposition to entertain. Uh, for any other kind of regulation, uh, banking regulation or whatever, down to things like foreign aid and war, to make the similar statement, in other words, to go a little bit deeper into just, just tariffs, where the thing is, ob is obvious, uh, the tariffs are agitated for by the particular industry, to expand the analysis a little bit, 
uh, becomes, uh, uh, unsu becomes uh, unrespectable, to say the least, and both among historians and among everybody else. So uh, <clears throat> people engaging in this sort of analysis, or power elite analysis, if you want to call it that, uh, uh, it's, it's not very common either in the either in hist historical profession or in the rest of scholarship or in the public. And, uh, but in the last 20 years or so, there has been quite a bit of it, and it's been it's revised, it's helped to revise our whole viewpoint of what happened uh, in, in, in government regulation in general and the progressive period in particular. <clears throat> the, uh, basically what happened was in the progressive period, uh, by the end of the 19th century, business, first of all, was very extremely competitive all during the late 19th century. Uh, this is uh, as a broad generalization. <clears throat> and uh, prices were falling throughout. In other words, from the Civil War down to, the, down to about 1900, 18, late 1890s, prices were generally falling. And they were falling for good reason, namely that business was so competitive and the economy was so productive that the supply of goods and services was increasing at a rapid rate. In other words, that's when America industrialized. It was the biggest uh, per period of economic growth in the history of the world. And uh, standard of living went up um, and Productivity went up and prices fell. This did not mean the business, businesses were suffering because costs were also falling as the productivity increased and mass production increased. Um, but it, so in this situation, the uh, many business groups who, who tended to be inefficient try to co correct this, try to try to correct this price falling situation by organizing cartels. In other words, by organizing a cartel of each industry so that they could cut production and raise prices. And this was tried in industry after industry, uh, starting with the railroads, which were the first big business in the United States, first large-scale business, and continuing on through manufacturing by the late 1890s, uh, either trying through cartels, formal cartels, or through mergers. And in the late, late 1890s, the theory was, uh, we'll just merge into one big, we'll have one big firm for the entire steel industry, the oil industry, et cetera, and then we'll be able to cut production and raise prices and raise profits at the same time. <clears throat> Uh, so they tried this systematically. This was the ideology, so to speak, among businessmen, <clears throat> that <clears throat> the way to benefit for all of us is to have quotas, either formal quotas as in cartels or in mergers where you, you just agree that you will have certain shares of this corporation and then we'll cut production and raise prices. That was the great goal. All of this was a total flopperoo. And case after case, hundred, literally hundreds of cases of this kind of merger or cartel, they all flopped. And they flopped... Uh, um, for two basic reasons. One is that uh, an economic theory can predict this, and this is confirmed time and time again. Uh, two basic reasons. One is, well, the basic reason is that the industry is free. Government cannot did not step in and, and force people to accept the cartel or accept the merger. So what happens is that when the, as soon as the cartel is formed or the merger is, is completed, and we have, and then they cut production and raise prices and profits go up. Other businessmen come in and say, hey, this looks like a great industry here. The, the zinc, the zinc industry, whatever, the zinc industry or the oil industry or the whatever, railroads, they're making a lot of profits. Let's nip in there and, and outcompete them because they're raising prices. They're, and we, we're going to come in with a new firm, a new factory, a new railroad, and we'll, uh, we'll bust them. And that's exactly what happened. So you had new, new competition always coming in and, and uh, outcompeting the the, the older firms, and then the older firms are stuck with a new firm. Then you have a permanent competitor, which is a big pain in the neck as they come in with later equipment, with new factories and new equipment, the latest, uh, the latest technology, et cetera. And now they have a permanent new competitor on their hands. So it became, the whole thing became a big pain in the neck for them. And that's one reason. And then internally what happened, what happened was that individual firms would start breaking the cartel. They say, look, we, we raised, in other words, the cartel restricts production raises prices, prices are very high, and then the individual firm says, look, uh, I'm not supposed to do this because I have a cartel agreement with the rest of my buddies in the, in the, in the industry, but uh, here's what we're going to do. For you, my old pal and drinking buddy or whatever, the, my buyer, uh, I will sell you the steel or the whatever, titanium, et cetera, for 20% off list, provided you don't tell anybody about it. Okay. So what you have is <laughs> a secret price cutting. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, and, of course, and then this firm gains profits, gains sales, and of course the secret leaks out pretty quickly after about six months or a year, and then the other firms get very mad about this, and they call it your, your rate buster, which is the, in business terms is equivalent to scab in union terms. And, uh, and the whole cartel falls apart with mutual recrimination and hatred, and they're back where they started, except now they've got more hatred than they had before. 
So, this, so in other words, this system didn't work. The cartel uh, policy and the merger policy flopped. And uh, <clears throat> at that point, some of the, uh, each step of the way, some of the more far-sighted in the sense of realizing this was a flop uh, among the business groups decided the only way to preserve a cartel or preserve a merger is to have the government enforce it. The term, turn of the political arm to create the cartel for you. And this, uh, this was the origin of progressive regulation. The progressive system was not a group of far-sighted, uh, essentially it was not a group of far-sighted intellectuals who sat around and said we have to plan, we have to curb businessmen for the sake of the public interest. It was a group of bu groups of businessmen saying we have to impose cartels through the government uh, and thereby eliminating our competition, curbing the, the, the maverick firm which doesn't want to engage in a cartel and, uh, and gaining profits that way. So. <clears throat> For example, with, in, the, in, in, in railroad regulation, the first things they did after the business put in the, the railroad business businesses put in the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the first thing the ICC did was to outlaw secret price cutting. So, because secret price cutting is always the great instrument by which an individual firm can bust the cartel. And you do, how you do it? You do it in the name of publicity. Or you say, well, it's a terrible thing to have a secret price cutting. All prices should be, the book should be open. Uh, all firms should, have, they should release publicity about their prices and costs, and suffer, et cetera, so the public will know, the right to know, and all that jazz. What it really meant was, we want to know what our competitors are charging, and we do it by making the government make all of us release, you know, open the books. So anyway, this is, and of course, you do this in the name of, of, of openness, or democracy, or whatever, in the name of the public interest, because uh, America was born in an anti-monopoly ideology. A, a, a hatred of monopoly, meaning, by the way, monopoly meant uh, f for centuries until modern economics came in and poisoned the well, so to speak. Uh, what monopoly meant was very simple. It meant a, a grant of special privilege on the part of the government to different businesses to exclusive, for exclusive production or sale of a product, period. It, it didn't mean a large firm. It didn't mean uh, a differentiated product and all the rest of it. And it's, it meant very simply grant by the government of exclusive privilege. Uh, it's very much like the like, uh, during the discussion of Professor Peden before that uh, uh, when the church fathers attacked the rich, they didn't mean the rich period, they meant uh, the tax collectors and so forth. It's, it's, it's a similar situation, a shift in the language. So, uh, so how could they sell this to the American public? How, how could these business groups sell this, a compulsory cartel system to the American public? They can't say we want compulsory cartels. So what they did was, they created the ideology of the public interest. This is the public good. We have to curb evil business groups and sort of stuff. And the, the businessmen who took this position were then called enlightened by their, by their allies, by the, by the media, whatever, the media of that epoch. These are enlightened businessmen who rise above their own self-interest to look at the larger good. They have the far vision of, not, like Diocletian, <laughs> uh, they, they want to curb their selfish profits for the, for the good of the entire industry and the good of the country. Uh, now, how was this ideology pushed? The ideology was pushed very simply by intellectuals who were, who were rising up. Uh, uh, throughout history, the, the statism has been imposed by two groups, an alliance of two groups. The, uh, the state itself, uh, the state apparatus, the, the king, the throne, and the opinion molding groups, the intellectuals, which, which in most cases in history have been the churches, the state church. And so this is known as the alliance of throne and altar. You have the church and the state, the church, the function of the church was to tell the, to, to tell the people to obey the state. The state is God in many cases. The king is God. The king is divinely sanctioned. And uh, in return for this, uh, and, they, and the public believes them, because they are the intellectual opinion molders. And, uh, and in return for that, the, uh, the church gets part of the boodle. They get part of the state revenue in the form of tax uh, subsidies and so forth. So this is a very cozy alliance until essentially Western Europe, until the, the age of Western Europe. And... Uh, when church and state were separated. And essentially, what you, what in the progressive period in the early 20th century, you begin to reform the, the old alliance of, of intellectuals and government, big government intellectuals, who for, perform the function of court, court apologists for the new regime. And, and, and forming the public, this is, your, your, this is the public interest, the common good, the general welfare, and all the rest of it. Now, the intellectuals are ready for this alliance because there are a lot of them coming up. There's a multiplication of the number of intellectuals in the world. In, in this country in the late 19th century. Uh, the, PhD, the PhD program came in. Uh, 
suddenly PhDs poured on the market, uh, engineers poured on the market, various guild groups, physicians, all that, and they're looking for, they're looking for jobs and also looking for special privilege. They're looking for ways to keep their competitors out. <clears throat> and so this alliance became a very cozy one because the intellectuals then became state intellectuals. They became planners, apologists for planning, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> Okay, so this, this, this is a general background of a banking situation. So we have to realize the Federal Reserve System was a progressive measure. 1913, it was, it was part of the Wilson Progressive Package, Woodrow Wilson being the acme of progressivism up to that point. Uh, and once again, we have a similar situation. There was no, before the Federal Reserve System, there was no free banking. There was a quasi-centralized system. Uh, free banking or an approximation of free banking was before the Civil War, approximately from the, 18, from the 1840s after Andrew Jackson destroyed the, the central bank of his epoch until the Civil War. During those, those 20 years or so, it was more or less free banking system, competitive, there was no centralized system, uh, and uh, it, worked for, it, it worked pretty well. And the, one of the, uh, the, to the extent it didn't work is because there was still government interference. But basically a free system. Uh, during the Civil War, the Republican Party <clears throat> took the opportunity of a one-party Congress, since the, since the South had seceded, to enact uh, their, their beloved uh, economic legislation, one of which <clears throat> was high tariffs, another of which was uh, uh, the greenbacks, and it was eliminating the gold standard for, for many years. And a third was, the, uh, was to eliminate the free banking system. Um, the way they did it was by uh, imposing a very prohibitive tax on state banknotes, in other words, of banks, private banks, uh, and uh, centralizing them, monopolizing the issue of bank notes or paper money in the hands of a few nationally chartered banks. There were no nationally chartered banks before that. A few, uh, very few large Wall Street banks. And then tying this so, that, so any other bank had to, in order to get paper money, had to go to the, to the had to have deposits in the national banks and, and uh, in order to buy paper money, so to speak, because the, the individual banks couldn't issue it themselves, and uh, tying that to the federal to the public debt. In other words, the national banks could have pyramid their uh, credit on top of government U.S. government bonds, and this was done in order in order to sell the government bonds uh, during the war, the, the Civil War, um, and specifically to get even more specific than that, <clears throat> uh, Jay Cook was the main in, in, uh, instigator of this. Jay Cook was. Uh, uh, being a friend of uh, Secretary of Treasury Chase and a political ally, uh, managed to get the, the monopoly of all government bond underwriting during the, during the Civil War. Remember, there was hardly any underwriting at all before that. And uh, so this is a tremendous bonanza to Cook. And uh, he gets the monopoly of all government bond issue. He then, he then, uh, he was the first one to engage in modern propaganda efforts. He had the higher pamphleteers to talk about the glories of government bonds and all the rest of it. And, uh, in addition to that, he, he essentially pushed through the national banking system, the system I've been talking about, founding their, so every national bank has to, has, to, has to permit credit on top of government bonds which they own, thereby forcing the banks to buy government bonds from him, Jay Cook, since he had the control of all government bonds. And then he himself set up several of these national banks himself as part of this uh, system. So at any rate, we had, this is the uh, after that, this, this system continues after the Civil War, <clears throat> And the hard money people were, had to spend about at least 15 years trying to get back to gold, period. They couldn't worry about the banking system. And so the, their energies was, were, um, were restricted or confined to, the, to get, eliminating greenbacks or getting, you know, getting back to gold. <clears throat> so that this system then continues on. We then have a quasi-centralized system based on Wall, on Wall Street uh, National, a few Wall Street National banks. But it still was not central. It was a halfway house to the Federal Reserve System. Okay, in this, uh, in this situation, the, uh, the banks become unhappy, especially the large Wall Street banks uh, become unhappy because they're beginning to be outcompeted by other, other regional bank, banking structures. Chicago uh, becomes a, a central reserve city. Uh, Kansas City banks become important. And the whole uh, the, the banking credit system becomes more and more decentralized as the, as the economy grows. And the, uh, the Wall Street became, banks become more and more unhappy about the situation. The, 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 the control is slipping away from them uh, gradually but very rapidly. <clears throat> and uh, another problem was, and uh, this, this is a problem inherent in all fractional reserve banking. Uh, fractional reserve banking, is, in my view, is inherently bankrupt. I mean, it's, it's always a, ready to go bust. Uh, 
the reason is fairly simple. Most businesses, or uh, all businesses, as far as I know, try to try to adjust the time structure of their assets to 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 uh, flow with the time structure of their liabilities. In other words, if you have a one million dollar debt coming up in next July first, you make sure that the million dollars you have coming in owed to you will come in before July first, not after. So you'll have the million bucks to pay pay the uh, your your own uh, your own creditor. So most businesses try to have the time structure of their assets shorter than the time structure of their liabilities. Uh, certainly not longer. So have the money flowing in before they have to pay the money out. With banks, however, just the opposite. Banks are banks' liabilities are zero time structure. In other words, they, you have to pay immediate. I'm not talking about certificates of deposit or time deposit. I'm talking about demand deposits and bank notes. These have to be paid on demand immediately. It's a zero time structure. Whereas their assets, of course, are at some you know flow into the future. So all banks are inherently bankrupt. All of these for the public to find out about it. Essentially, it's a, it's a structure based on uh, mythology more than anything else. Uh, and uh, so all banks are subject to bank runs. And historically, when, when confidence is lost, I don't know if you've seen these old movies on television where made in the 30s. There were a lot of movies in that period where uh, there's, a, there's a small town and there's a big lineup from 5 in the morning and lining up at the bank because the public had heard a rumor that the bank was really didn't have the money they thought they'd have. And, the, and they want to get their money out fast before the other guy get the money out. So there's a long line of the banker is, of course, very respectable looking, usually fat. In those days, fatness meant respectability. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the banker was sure of them. No, it's a, bunch of, it's a pack of lies. And we, I assure you, madam and mister, that you, the money is there. Don't worry about it. So don't, you don't have to take it out. And if, if the people are astute enough or scared enough, they'll say, no, no, we want our money out. We don't listen to this stuff. Of course, the banker was a big liar since he didn't have the money. <laughs> and by 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, the bank is, is bust. So... Uh, so the banks understand the situation. They're, they're inherently in a state of in, in, in bad shape. Plus the fact that if any banks expand their credit, uh, banks that don't expand will, 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 will have liabilities upon them and try to cash them in, not because they don't have no confidence, it's simply in, in a daily matter of business, and they might go bust for that for that reason. Any bank that expands beyond what his fellow bankers are expanding uh, will, will quickly go under. So for those reasons, uh, it became evident to the banker, banking community that uh, they, they, in order for the banks, these fractional reserve banks to survive, you have to have a central bank, a lender of last resort, as it's called, which will have the resources to bail them out in the case of trouble. And also, will be able to centralize reserves so that all, all banks will more or less expand reserves together. So you don't have a problem with one bank expanding and suddenly being caught up short by the sounder and more conservative banks. All banks will expand through, the, through a central banking system. Central bank buying assets and the reserves flooding into the system and the credits, everything ballooning and wafting upward nicely and harmoniously and uniformly. In other words, the banks realize in order, in order, in order to preserve their, their, uh, their soundness and structure, they have to have a uh, compulsory cartelized system because voluntary cartels don't work in banking much very well either. Um, so in other words, the turn toward uh, compulsory cartels and banking was very similar of, of a piece with, with the turn toward compulsory cartels and the rest of business, industry, railroads, manufacturing, meatpacking, insurance, and everything else. Um, okay, the, uh, <clears throat> and also the Wall Street banks were particularly interested in getting control over the rest of the economy and as a second factor here, not just to save themselves, but also to get control of the maverick uh, Western and, and regional banks that were proliferating. And in particular, the, uh, the person, the, the, the banking firm of the most vision on this subject, the one which always took the lead in cartelization and regulatory commissions and all the rest of it, was the firm of the, the interest centered around J.P. Morgan and Company. Uh, Morgan being the largest investment banker after Jay Cook. By the way, the justice doesn't always triumph in the world, but in the case of Jay Cook, Justice Triumph, he went bust in the Panic of 1873 after, after uh, controlling the banking system and inflating and so forth and so on. He finally, he finally went under. After that, J.P. Morgan becomes the, the preeminent investment banker. <clears throat> and uh, first on the railroads and then in manufacturing, Morgan takes the lead in, um, in this vision of a new cartelized system, including a new cartelized banking system. <clears throat> okay, just to give you an idea, <clears throat> um, a, here's a quote here uh, on the role of the Fed and what, what the people at the time thought the role of the Fed was going to be. 
Oh, just, just another point. The, the, the theory propounded before the public was, and the public, again, is not going to fall for this very well. So the theory propounded before the public was we need the Fed, one, to catch up with the world, because everybody else had a bank, all other major countries had a central bank. Therefore, we should have it. Uh, and uh, secondly, in order to stop wildcat banks from inflating too much, we need a central bank in order to impose stability and make sure not, uh, to limit any inflationary potential of the, of the private banks. It's very similar to the, to the saying the IC, we need an interstate commerce commission to control the railroads. They won't, they won't milk the public by higher freight rates. Actually, the real reason was they wanted to raise private freight, uh, freight rates, railroad freight rates, through the ICC and not to, not to lower them. Similarly here, the propaganda is that we need if the Fed, in order to control the individual private banks, make sure to, they don't expand credit too much. The real was, reason was they want to expand, they, they need the Fed to expand credit and maintain the expanded credit so the banks wouldn't go under. We need a, a lender of last resort. Or to use the phrase in the very common of that period, we need, the money supply needs to be more elastic. That was the big phrase. We need a Fed because we need the money supply to be more elastic. In, in other words, the money supply isn't, is too, is too rigid. We need to expand it more, especially during recessions and bank panics. We need a Fed to expand money and credit. Uh, and so this is, yeah, this is what they meant. Elasticity was a sort of euphemism for, the, for inflation. At any rate, uh, to quote, um, uh, which is just one area here that, to show the, the criterion of the whole system, uh, Edward N. Hurley, when the Federal Trade Commission was established, about the same time the Federal Reserve was established, um, the vice chairman, of, uh, de facto head of the Federal Trade Commission, was Edward N. Hurley, who was the uh, president of the Illinois Manufacturers Association when he was appointed, and whose actions and an appointment was hailed and whose subsequent actions were hailed throughout the business community. He addressed the Association of National Advertisers in December 1915, a couple of years after the, Fed, the Federal Reserve and the Federal Trade Commission were put through about the same time. He exulted, quote, that through a period of years, the government has been gradually extending its machinery of helpfulness to different classes and groups upon whose prosperity depends in a large degree the prosperity of a country. And then he says, the railroads and the shippers had the ICC. They had their ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission. The farmers had the Agriculture, Agriculture Department. And the bankers now have the Federal Reserve Board. He concluded, quote, that to do for general business that which these other agencies do for the groups to which I have referred was the thought behind the creation of the Federal Trade Commission. OK, what did the Federal Reserve do for the nation's bankers? That, that, that then becomes the question. Uh, Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> it starts, this, the idea of central banking, before the Federal Reserve comes in, the, uh, the, uh, the first thought was the Treasury would do it. Instead of creating a Federal Reserve, maybe the, the Treasury Department could act as a central bank on its own. Uh, and then, for example, in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, 1900, uh, Secretary of Treasury Lyman Gage called for the establishment of regional central banks. And in 1906, uh, Secretary of Treasury Leslie Shaw suggested in his annual report that he be given total power to regulate the nation's banks. Uh, it didn't work. But this was the, uh, and they tried to intervene. They tried to, both of them tried to expand Treasury bills and so forth during recessions. Uh, it, it, uh, they didn't work. And uh, the question then is, who are these people? Who are, who are Gage and, and Shaw? Do they do this? Uh, do they either call for central banks or try to impose a, act as a central bank on their own hook? Are they isolated bureaucrats uh, where power went to their head? And uh, in order to analyze that, we have to realize that <clears throat> most historians, unfortunately, they deal, when they deal with government action, they just deal with the secretary of, or treasury or the Federal Reserve chairman or whatever at the time he exists, in other words, it's as if somebody dropped from heaven, becomes Secretary of the Treasury for four years or eight years or something, and then disappears. And his life then is, is sort of like a, like a like self-contained, hermetically sealed vacuum. And he does various things, and he disappears. And if, if, however, you examine what he did before he was Secretary of Treasury and what he did after, you have a very different perspective. I don't mean just on these people. I mean all the, all the top bureaucrats. If you, if you examine what their life was before and after they were in, in office, uh, the whole viewpoint, your whole viewpoint about them begins to shift. They turn not to be isolated bureaucrats, but part of a whole financial network of uh, power elite. 
For example, uh, Gage, the first Secretary of Treasury uh, under McKinley, who tried to do this, uh, before he was appointed Secretary of Treasury, he was the head of the powerful First National Bank of Chicago, one of the major banks in those days in the Rockefeller orbit. And now we have to say that there were two big financial orbits at this point, the Morgans and the Rockefellers, both of whom uh, were in favor of, federal, of, of central banking by this point. Okay. Um, he was also president of the American Bankers Association, Gage. After he left the Treasury Department, after a couple of years, he becomes president of the U.S. Trust Company, which was Rockefeller controlled, and has handpicked the assistant of the Treasury, Frank Vanderlip, who was uh, one of the major figures in creating the Federal Reserve System, goes on to become a top executive of the Rockefeller flagship bank of that period, the National City Bank of New York. Uh, he was appointed at the Treasury, not because he was, his name was plucked out of a hat, but because Mark Hanna, his close friend and political mastermind and financial backer of President McKinley, uh, chairman of the Ohio Republican Party and then the National Republican Party, coal magnate and iron manufacturer, Hanna, was also a close business associate of and an old, high, old friend and high school classmate of John D. Rockefeller Sr. So when you begin to realize that, you begin to realize it's not an accident. These things are not, it's not that Hannah somehow has a theory and or, you know, the thing just, it, it works somehow by, by a random selection of people. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> okay, Leslie Shaw, who was the, the next Secretary of Treasury I mentioned, under, under, who was under Theodore Roosevelt, uh, was a small-town Iowa banker who became governor of his state. He continued as president of a bank while he was governor. In those days, it was not uh, none of this nonsense about blind trust or, or uh, <laughs> worry about conflict of interest. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and he was a friend and ally of the so-called Des Moines Regency, which was running the Iowa Republican Party for many years. And uh, the head of the Iowa, Iowa Regency, Senator Allison, <clears throat> was in turn tied closely to Charles Perkins, who was the a close Morgan ally and president of the Morgan-controlled Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. Okay, after the, after the failure of these two attempts by Gage and Shaw to, to use the Treasury as a, as a fulcrum of a central bank, comes the Panic of 1907. It was at that point when the, when the large bankers decided we need a, we, no, no more fooling around, fellas, we need a central bank. Uh, and, but even before the Panic of 1907, the, the, the drive for a central bank was launched officially by Jacob Schiff, who was head of the powerful investment banking firm of Kuhn Loeb and Company, who urged the New York Chamber of Commerce to advocate fundamental banking reforms. This is January 1906. Okay? And the New York Commerce immediately established a special committee to investigate the problem, comprised of leaders from commercial investment banking, including Isidore Strauss of R.H. Macy's, who was a close friend of Schiff, and Frank Vandalip, I've already mentioned, whose, whose name appears, pops up constantly of the National City Bank. <clears throat> uh, in March, the special committee, unsurprisingly, by the way, all, all of you know about committees in general, know that the committees decide nothing. It's all decided ahead of time. <laughs> the committee ratifies it. Uh, the special committee reports, yes, yes, we need a central bank, and as they put it, we need a strong central bank, quote, similar to the Bank of Germany, unquote, which was the, which was the role model for them. <clears throat> well, the New York Chamber was kind of reluctant. This is kind of radical for them. They, they didn't endorse it. But the big bankers took up the, 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 the cry, and in, in mid-1906, the American, Banking Com American Bankers Association named a commission of inquiry of leading bankers to study the, the question, and the uh, report, again, calls for radical changes and, and, and more or less of a central bank. Uh, by that time, after the Panic of 1907, as I say, then they, then they realized, boy, we really need a central bank. We have to start get going on this. And... Uh, the, uh, one of the things that were passed during this panic of 1907 was the Oldrich Vreeland Act, which uh, provided for the issuance of so-called emergency currency by groups of bankers clustered in national currency associations. Uh, it was a regional cartel scheme for each, you know, each region. But uh, it was supposed to be a stopgap for the emergency, but it was, the emergency was seven years, which is a hell of a long emergency period, uh, during which they could issue these, uh, these, uh, these notes. Uh, However, Oldrich Vreeland really wasn't used, it was only used once. The, the main thing that came out of the Oldrich Vreeland Act of 1908 was um, the uh, <clears throat> setting up of a National Monetary Commission by the, by the, National, by the Oldrich Vreeland Act uh, to study the American and foreign banking systems and, and emerge with a plan for reform. The commission consisted of nine, nine senators and nine representatives, as the usual kind of government commission. Uh, and the and standard bureaucratic procedure, the chairman was Senator Oldrich, who 
who passed the act, and the vice chairman was Representative Vreeland, who's you know the other co-sponsor. Well, Vreeland is unimportant. He was a Buffalo banker, and we could see, need say no more about him. Uldrich is a person of a different stamp. Extremely powerful senator from Rhode Island, Republican senator, who made millions during his long service in the U.S. Senate. It's not quite known exactly how he did it. And he started off as a fairly humble grocer. And uh, <laughs> he winds up after you know, 30 years in the Senate as a multimillionaire, which those days meant multi-multi-million. I mean, million meant a lot then. <laughs> uh, Oldrich, again, it's not an accident. He's one, uh, one of the prime movers in the creation of the Federal Reserve System. He was also the father-in-law of John, John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and uh, may be fairly said, I think, to be Rockefeller's person, his man in the U.S. Senate. Uh, it was from Nelson Oldrich, our beloved governor of New York. I come from New York. Uh, Nelson Oldrich Rockefeller took his first two names. Um, okay, from the inception of this National Monetary Commission until the, until the Oldrich plan was presented to Congress four years later, it was um, uh, 1909 and 1913, Oldrich and, his, and the commission were a vital key in the drive for a central bank. Uh, particularly influential in the deliberations of the commission were two men who were not official members. This often happens, of course. Most of the senators and congressmen barely, rarely showed up at the, the, you know, at the sessions. Oldrich asked J.P. Morgan to recommend a banking expert. Who else? Who better than Morgan to recommend an expert? And he recommended very happily with, happily responded with Henry P. Davison, a Morgan partner, and George Reynolds was president of the American Bankers Association. You have to realize the way the Morgans worked in that period, um, uh, investment banks are partnership, uh, partnerships and not corporations. I think it's still true. And the Morgan firm assigned several partners to be their political arms, so to speak. They're, they're, they're people in politics. And uh, Henry Davison was one of them. Another was George W. Perkins, who, who winds up as head of the Progressive Party of America. Uh, and uh, a bunch of others, Thomas W. Lamont, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so, um, so that was one big focus, the old rich Rockefeller connection and, and, and now Morgan uh, coming in with, with a Morgan partner as a key person here. Another, another prime foco for the, for, the, for the drive for Central Bank was Paul Moritz Warburg, uh, who uh, was a scion of the great international banking family, a German banking firm of M.M. Warburg and Company of Hamburg, who emigrates to the United States in 1902 to become a partner in the influential banking house of Kuhn Lullivan Company. What you have to realize about Warburg is he spent all of his time, apparently his full time, not in investment banking, but in pushing the idea of a central bank in print and in lectures and all that sort of stuff. He was being paid, I think, about 600000 a year, which you know, meant about, I don't know what it is now, $6 million or something like that, more than that, uh, just for the purpose of propagandizing for a central bank. <laughs> okay. uh, the, um, he was... Uh, he was sensitive to the uh, to the idea to the to the view to uh, idea that uh, uh, the, the public didn't like central banks, didn't like a central control, was suspicious of Wall Street, and so forth. And uh, you, you then had a certain amount of jockeying for for power and influence on the part of uh, or specifics on the part of the various pro central bankers. They had to work out a whole bunch of things here, and uh, they had to work out the provisions. They had to work out the general situation. Interestingly enough, Oldrich, the politician wanted a straight central bank, that's it, the Bank of the United States, whatever, and period. And Warburg, the, the banker, said, no, no, the American public won't accept this. We needed phony decentralization. We needed the, the, the idea of regional banks with the Federal Reserve Board, which would be only to supervise it, because the public won't accept a straight, outright centralization. We need the content of centralization with a form of decentralization. So, uh, which of course, you know, is the thing that eventually happens. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> in order to, uh, to, to finally iron out their differences in, uh, in November, I think, 1910, I think it was, um, the, um, the top, the top pro-central banking people met in a famous secret meeting, a clandestine meeting, it's famous now, at Jekyll Island, Georgia, the Jekyll Island Club of Jekyll Island, Georgia, which was a duck shooting retreat. Uh, and they, they, there was a big secrecy involved, because the, the press was all interested in the activities of the, all these people. And, uh, they told the press, no, no, we're just going for, we're taking a special railroad, chartering a special railroad car, and going down to Georgia for duck shooting. We're not going to talk about anything spe specific, anything economic. And uh, they, all, they all travel under assumed names in this railroad car, which Oldrich chartered, and, um, and somehow they managed to talk the press out of, out of pu publicizing this. And uh, don't investigate this too, 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 I don't know how they did it, but somehow transactions occurred, <laughs> gentle persuasion occurred, and nothing was mentioned of it at the time. 
Okay, so they met for about a week at Jekyll Island. The, the people who met were symbolized the, the power elite involved in the pushing for the Federal Reserve System. Uh, Senator Ulrich was there, of course. He had shorted the car, railroad car. It's not really known who got them in there because n none of these guys were club members of the Jekyll Island Club, and somebody had to you know, reserve the space for them. It was probably J.P. Morgan who, who was a member of the of Jekyll Island Club. And these other guys weren't big shoddy enough <laughs> to be members. <laughs> So Senator Aldrich was there. Henry Davison, the Morgan partner, was there, I've already mentioned. Paul Warburg, the Kuhn Lower partner, was there. Frank Vanderlip, vice president of Rockefeller's National City Bank. Charles Norton, who was president of Morgan's first national bank in New York. And A. Pyatt Andrew, who was the economist. He was the Harvard economist. You have to have some technician to work out the specifics, who was staff assistant to Aldrich. And this, again, this symbolizes the unity of, of business, government, and e economics, or economists. <laughs> um, Okay, so it's, it's, it's a living embodiment, as I say, of the Kuhn, Rockefeller, Kuhn, Lowe, Morgan interests allied in this great struggle, uh, uh, aided by uh, economic technicians. Okay, they draft the bill for the central bank. They draft what was later to become the Federal Reserve Act, almost, almost word for word, I mean, except for tiny details. Uh, the draft was essentially written by Warburg with a decentralized soupçon uh, added from others. Uh, the final writing, the actual writing, was contributed by Vanderlip. And I uh, say the main disagreement was Aldrich wanted a straight central bank, and Warburg said, no, no, we have to have a phony facade of decentralization. Okay, and Aldrich finally, they, they make the agreement. Aldrich, Aldrich presents the draft to the National Monetary Commission in January 1911, and slightly revised, it was introduced as a commission report or a commission bill, as the Aldrich bill, um, a year later, and then, which in turn became the Federal Final Reserve Act. Okay, the... Uh, <clears throat> Now, the interesting thing is that Ulrich and the Monetary Commission, they were ready for the report by January 1911, as I said. They delayed it for a whole year. Why did they delay it? Because by this time, in the elections of 1910, the Democrats won uh, the, the Congress. And uh, so, at this point, they realized they had to do some more spade work. They had to convert the Democrats, and they also had to convert the rest of the public. They couldn't just drive the thing through. So we needed a, a year of, of propaganda and agitation. Uh, before they actually presented the Federal Reserve Bill. So, at the beginning of 19, February 1911, this, this educational campaign starts. 22 top bankers from 12 cities meet in Atlantic City to consider the oil rich plan. Uh, they warmly endorse it, of course, and um, the, um, as the James Forgan, who was president of the First National Bank of Chicago, which was Rockefeller Control, as he put it, uh, the real purpose of this conference was to discuss winning the banking community over to government control directed by the bankers for their own ends. I'm going to repeat that. The real purpose of this conference is to discuss winning the banking community over to government control directed by the bankers for their own ends. Okay. Uh, I was educating the bankers. This, is, this, isn't really, this is not the kind of government intervention you don't like, folks, fellas. This is, this is it. This is great, good stuff. Uh, it was generally appreciated uh, by the conference this would increase the power of the big national banks to compete with the rapidly growing state banks, uh, privately, you know, with state chartered private banks, help bring those state banks under control, and strengthen the position of the national banks in foreign banking activities. Okay, by November 1911, Ulrich combined with the big bankers win the support of the American Bankers Association, the big trade association of bankers. And Ulrich um, addresses the association in a speech, and he says, the organization proposed is not a bank, but a cooperative union of all the banks of the country for definite purposes. Uh, for, for the lay public, Aldrich and his colleagues created an, an organization in the spring of 1911 called the National Citizens League for the Creation of a Sound Banking System. Um, the league grew out of a resolution which Paul Warburg had pushed through a meeting of the National Board of Trade in January 1910, setting aside January 18th of, of 1911 to be Monetary Day, devoted to a, quote, businessmen's monetary conference. At that January 1911 meeting, the conference appointed a committee of seven, headed by Warburg, to organize the Businessman's Monetary Reform League. Uh, a group of leading Chicago businessmen were then organized. And the idea was they should establish the, the, the Citizens League, not in New York, which is suspect, but in Chicago, the heartland of America. So it looks like a grassrootsy organization. And J. Lawrence Lachlan, the economist who was the operating head of it, admitted that later, you know, later years. Yeah, yeah, this whole thing was a banker's front, which he, of course, was in favor of. So, uh, <clears throat> The, um, the stated purpose of the League, for example, is to advance the cause of, quote, cooperation with dominant centralization of all banks by an evolution out of our clearinghouse experience. And um, 
Then there was various splits, and there were personality conflicts in the league, and so forth and so on, which are really unimportant. And historians, unfortunately, tend to focus on these minor issues of you know, clause seven versus clause eight, and all that sort of nonsense. At any rate, the, the key is that uh, uh, much of the much of the conflict. Uh, center around the fact that the Democrats, and, Lo and Lachlan, who was a Democrat, wanted to get rid of the evil name Aldrich, because Aldrich was a big shot Republican, from the bill. And so what finally happened, since the Democrats ran Congress at the time, it became the Glass Bill instead of the Aldrich Bill. That was the big, the big fight. It took a couple of years to work that, work that out. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, there were, all the big bankers were in favor of it. They didn't really care about the name on the bill. That's a, that's a matter of personal prestige or you know, that sort of stuff. Um, at the annual meeting of the American Bankers Association in August 1913, A. Barton Hepburn of the Chase National Bank exulted in a, about a successful effort to get the bankers to endorse the Glass Bill. Quote, the measure recognizes and adopts the principles of a central bank. Indeed, if it works out as the sponsors of the law hope, it will make all incorporated banks together joint owners of a central dominating power. Okay. Um, so the Federal Reserve System was then enacted in December 1913 and opened its doors the following November. 19, November 14. Um, and one at the same time, a cartelizing and inflationary organization. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, the bank structure was such that the banks, the banks themselves were very powerful in selecting Federal Reserve officials. Uh, there's a whole different structure, a different regional structure and all that. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the chief executive officer of each bank, which those days was called the, the governor and now called the president, was selected by the bank directors themselves. In other words, the, uh, uh, the, the regional bank directors were mostly bankers. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we have, of course, the Federal Reserve uh, Board. And the governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which th those days ran the system for, until 1929. Uh, the next step then is to analyze who, who these guys were. And this, of course, becomes important. The, um, another thing that happened, by the way, is the reserves were centralized in the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve Banks become the monopolists of all paper money, not just national banks, but now only the Federal Reserve can print paper money. And the reserve requirements were cut in half, thereby lending a great inflationary potential to the whole system. Reserve requirements before that were about 20%, and now go down about 10. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, okay, this, the bankers all hail the enactment of the Federal Reserve System. This is great stuff. And now we, they said we have to see who's going to run it. Now the next step is who, who the personnel are. Okay, there were seven members of the Federal Reserve Board in that period. of whom two were ex officio in those days, the Secretary of the Treasury and a control of the currency. So who are they? Well, Secretary of the Treasury and control of the currency before they assumed their posts. Again, who are they before they became big shots in the Wilson administration? They were close associates, business and financial associates themselves. Secretary of the Treasury William Gibbs McAdoo had been a failing businessman in New York City. He was a, he was a loser. He, 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 he set up several enterprises in his life and they all collapsed. For some reason, he was befriended. He, he, was, took the, he was taken a personal liking to by J.P. Morgan, which is something you want to have happen to you in those, <laughs> that period. And Morgan decided to bail McAdoo out. And uh, he set McAdoo up as president of New York's Hutton, Hudson and Manhattan Railroad, which ran the tubes uh, under the uh, Hudson River, uh, which he was, was before he became uh, Secretary of Treasury. <clears throat> he spent his entire life, the rest of his life, in the financial, Morgan financial ambit. Uh, his fellow board members and officers of the Hudson Manhattan Transit were all Morgan people. They were president of Morgan companies. They were uh, presidents of Morgan cartel, Morgan, Morgan merge companies in industry like uh, International Harvester and U.S. Steel, which were originally, by the way, monopoly. It was supposed to be a monopolies of the steel industry and the agricultural machinery industry. It didn't work. Uh, the whole thing was a flop from that perspective. Uh, <clears throat> So all these guys were on his board, and then when he, uh, after he becomes Secretary of the Treasury, Wilson cements, I mean, McAdoo cements his political stature by marrying the daughter of President Wilson, which is the second best thing for you to do if you're Wilson's president. One is you become a pal of Morgan, <laughs> and two, you become the son-in-law of Wilson. <laughs> uh, the controller of the currency was a longtime associate of McAdoo's. He was a Mag Virginia banker, president of the Richmond Trust Safe Deposit Company, John Skelton Williams, had been a director of McAdoo's Hudson Manhattan Railroad, and president of the Morgan-oriented Seaboard Airline Railway. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's those, that's those two guys. Who are the other five appointees? Who are the other five people whom Wilson appointed to the Federal Reserve Board? Well, it was Charles Hamlin, who was another close associate of McAdoo. Uh, he was a Boston attorney who had married into the wealthy Prine family of Albany. 
a family long connected with the New York Central Railroad, which had been run by the Morgans for about four decades by this point. Uh, the other three, the other four appointees were Paul Warburg, we've already talked about. Frederick Delano was the uncle of Franklin D. Roosevelt, president of the Rockefeller Control Wabash Railway, and known as Uncle, uncle, uncle Fred, I think, in the uh, New Deal period. <laughs> Uh, William P.G. Harding was president of the First National Bank of Birmingham, Alabama. <clears throat> and son-in-law of Joseph Woodward, who was head of the Woodward Iron Company, who was, which had several prominent Morgan and Rockefeller people on, on the board of directors. And finally, an economist, Professor Adolph C. Miller of the University of Chicago, and the land economic technician prestige. He, however, he wasn't just an, an ordinary economist. He was also, he had married into the wealthy Morgan-connected Sprague family of Chicago. His father-in-law, Otto Sprague, had been a prominent businessman and served as a director of the Morgan-dominated Pullman Company. And his, his wife's uncle, Albert Sprague, was director of the Chicago Telephone Company, subsidiary of the American Tel and Tel, which essentially was a Morgan-controlled monopoly. So, uh, <clears throat> so then we have, in other words, the Federal Reserve Board beginning its existence with three Morgan men, one Rockefeller type, and a Kuhn Loeb, ally with the Rockefellers, a prominent Alabama banker and an economist with vague Morgan family connections. That's the disinterested public's <laughs> public interest at work. <clears throat> okay, the, the guy who controlled the Federal Reserve System with an iron hand from, from the beginning until he died in 1928 was Governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, Benjamin Strong. He ran the system, much to the dis dislike of the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. And after he died, the, the law was changed to ensure the Federal Reserve Board was running things and not the governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Who was Benjamin Strong? Um, his policies were inflationary throughout and all that. So that's one that to talk about his policy. But who was he? Where did he come from? Again, he didn't drop out of the sky by a divine edict. Um, he, spent, he had spent before this virtually his entire business and personal life in the circle of top aides of J.P. Morgan. Uh, he was secretary of several trust companies in New York City, and he, was, he lived in the, in the suburb New York, Englewood, New Jersey, which in those days is a very wealthy suburb. It's come down a bit since then. Uh, and Englewood, he, he uh, became close friends of three top Morgan partners, which is the next best thing if you're not a friend of Morgan. You'd be a, a friend of three top Morgan partners. Henry P. Davison, we mentioned already, Thomas W. Lamont, and Dwight Morrow. <clears throat> Davison became Strong's mentor and offered him the post of secretary of the new Morgan Creative Bankers Trust Company. What was happening was the trust companies were popping up in that period. The banks wanted to get some p a piece of the action, and so Morgan created Bankers Trust for that purpose. Uh, soon after that, Strong again cemented his alliances by marrying the daughter of the wealthy Edmund Converse, president of the Bankers Trust, and uh, he soon succeeded Thomas Lamont as vice president. So you marry the daughter of the president, your pal of three Morgan partners. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, <clears throat> And not long after, where Converse was getting old, he becomes the, uh, the uh, virtual president, vice president, virtual pr president. Uh, <clears throat> okay, the uh, Strong had favored central banking until at least since 1907, and in August 1911, he participated with Nelson Aldrich in a lengthy meeting on the Aldrich plan <clears throat> with Davison, Vanderlip, and a few other big shots on, on Aldrich's yacht. <clears throat> okay. Uh, when the Federal Reserve System was established, uh, Warburg was also a close friend of Strong, offered the post of governor of New York Fed too strong. And he, first he said, no, he refused. He doesn't like the Fed because it's not enough of a central bank. He wants to run from New York, as he said, by board of directors on the ground in Wall Street. <clears throat> After a week in the country, Davison and Warburg persuaded Strong, don't worry about it, fella. This will be a central bank, <laughs> and you'll be running it. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> at that point, he, he accepted the job and became governor of New York Fed. We, for, we proceeded to assume absolute power. Okay, that's essentially the story of the founding of the Fed. As, as he put it, as Strong put it in a, in a um, uh, he was, he put it, for example, that um, when he was worried that the state banks refused to join the system, you know, state banks have the option of either joining the Fed or not, and he was worried about it, and he said, um, he said in a letter in October 1916, frankly, our bankers are more or less an unorganized mob. Until they are educated by experience of the advantages of cooperation through the reserve system, I believe it's unsafe to rely upon reserve contributed by their voluntary action. In other words, force them into the system. And in that way, every cartelist has always complained about individual businessmen who kick over the traces and, and don't accept the collective discipline of the cartel. Uh, the, um, 
Okay, Senator Carter Glass said when he drew up the, uh, the Glass bill, <clears throat> final Federal Reserve bill, and he said afterward, he looked back on his handiwork and he said that he thought it was great stuff about two years later. And he said, the proponents of the Federal Reserve Act had no idea of impairing the rightful prestige of New York as the financial metropolis of this hemisphere. They rather expected to confirm its distinction and even hoped to assist powerfully in wresting this scepter from London and eventually making New York the financial center of the world. Indeed, momentarily, this has come to pass. And we may point out, he goes, Carter Glass goes on, to the amazing contrast between New York under the old system in 1907, shaken to its very foundations because of two bank failures, and New York at the present time, under the new system, serenely secure in its domestic banking, banking operations and confidently financing the great enterprises of European nations at war. Okay, <laughs> it concludes my talk. Thank you. Murray, thank you very much. Um, again, a most informative and uh, detailed and interesting discussion. I think we can piece some things together from what we've seen thus far. Um, Professor Peden was up here telling us about government and inflation and how the government inflates. And, and one of the major messages I think we found in what Murray said is that when government becomes partner with the banking community, then that inflation becomes even more inevitable and the incentive system becomes one where it's in everybody's incentive who controls money and credit for even more inflation. Well, we have a few minutes for some questions. We're going to adjourn for lunch about 12.15, but please, let's ask some questions. Now, we'll have time later on, to can talk to Professor, Roth, Professor Rothbard at lunch or, or after our seminars today. I've been saving this question up for a long time, I, and I haven't had a chance to ask it to you. And it's uh, related to money, money, but not necessarily the history of the Federal Reserve. Right now, there's a lot of banks, or have been over the last few years, failing, and then the FDIC comes in and bails them out. And uh, I'm, I haven't figured out what the effect of that is on the economy when money is taken out of the system because of the failure of the banks. And then the F, uh, FDIC comes back and puts some new money back in with T-bills or whatever it does to prop it up. I, I, I know it has something to do with the business cycle, but I, I'm confused about exactly, I mean, I know, this is monetary inflation, but you're not necessarily seeing a whole bunch of price inflation. And I, I, I'm, one of the things I think I'm confused about is which causes the business cycle, what causes, causes distortions in the economy. Uh, I guess the, there's a lot of questions and all wrapped up into that, but what is the effect of banks failing today with the existing system where the FDIC comes back in and props it up? What is it going to do to the economy? What can we expect from here on out? Deflation in, uh, of prices, inflation of prices, or what kind of distortions? Well, I think uh, what's happened since, the, see, something, a sea change happened in 1933, namely, uh, the Fed had always been hampered in its inflationary potential and, and saving at the banks by the fact they had a gold standard to worry about. The Fed couldn't inflate too much because they had to pay, they had to pay in gold also. And so there were th literally thousands of bank failures in, during the early 30s. <clears throat> uh, with the federal, <clears throat> excuse me, with the uh, going off the gold standard and with the FDIC, um, the Fed now had unlimited power to expand and inflate. And uh, when the FDIC bailed out, for example, a Continental Illinois National Bank, the, the, they only had to bail out the people with deposits of 100,000 and under. They decided to bail out everybody. So they've already expanded now the, uh, the FDIC as, as universal deposit insurance. And the use of insurance, of course, is a euphemism. It means the government prints money and, 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 and bails out the banks. The key thing is the Federal Reserve has the unlimited power to print money. That's the key, create and manufacture money. Instead of money being minted by, uh, in gold or whatever, dug out of mines and, and painfully minted, making it therefore very scarce, uh, which preserves the soundness of the, of, the, of the money unit. Instead of that, the, the government, just the Federal Reserve, has the unlimited power to print whatever it wants. And so what it does is it prints 8 billion, 30 billion, whatever, and bails, bails out banks, buys assets, or whatever. The technical, uh, they do it to the tune of a lot of crises, uh, a lot of jetting back and forth across the world to save the you know, third world nations. But basically what it means is it's very simple. Basically it is the Fed prints dollars and hands it out. Okay. So this is monetary inflation. It's expanding the supply of dollars. That's the, that's the distortion that creates the business cycle. And uh, in order to try to, to eliminate recessions, which are the cause of, of, which is the result of inflation, they try to inflate more. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a spiral operation. And um, I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've been in a constant uh, argument with my hard money colleagues now for at least 10 years about whether deflation or inflation is on the horizon. And 
one of the, they, they sort of, in a sense, they have proclaimed victory recently because they redefined deflation. Uh, deflation now means any, any, inflation, any inflation of less than 10% a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Talking about changing linguistics. <laughs> uh, I take the old fashioned view of deflation means a, full, a substantial fall in the, in the cost of living. Okay. Not the fall in zinc prices or something like that, a fall in cost of living. And that, of course, hasn't happened and won't happen. And so, and it won't happen as long as the Federal Reserve has the uh, in, in infinite power to create money, which they, which they have. Uh, and so they'll find, if you have the power to create money, the power to print money, you'll do it. That's one of Rothbard's laws. I have my own laws. One is that if you have the power to print money, you'll do it. <laughs> okay? Regardless of any ideology or statements that you should limit your counterfeit operations to 3% a year as the Freemanites want to do. Basically, you'll print it. You, know, you, do, you find various reasons for it. You save banks, you save people, you save the people of Argentina, whatever. I mean, you've, there's lots of reasons for creating more money. <laughs> and that's the, really the problem. Well, the, the Federal Reserve has the power to, to print money, but they don't really print very much money. They, they print credit. And that's very different from money because it draws interest. And it looked like a good deal going in, but it, the interest becomes such a, a weight burden at some point, they can't expand credit. Then what happens? Well, they can expand credit. They print money and they create, they, usually the money goes out in the form of, of, of uh, buying assets of one sort or another. So um, if, they buy, uh, if they buy government bonds, for example, uh, this means the government bond dealer gets whatever, the money for, say, a million, say, say, say the Fed buys a, writes out a check for a million dollars of government bonds. The bond dealer gets the million dollar check, which means the Federal, says the Federal Reserve System promises to pay to the bearer a million dollars. He can't do it because only banks can, can have deposit accounts with the, with the Federal Reserve Bank. So he deposits it in his bank, or else he tears it up, which he won't do. He deposits it in Chase or Citibank or whatever. They get a reserve increase of a million dollars. They pyramid credit 10 to 1 on top of it. This is basically what happens. In other words, it's a creation of money through the fact that the Federal Reserve has the power to print. Because if anybody asks the Fed to redeem your, your deposits in dollars, they'll print the dollars and redeem it. So the, the power to actually print the money is the basis for the whole uh, inflationary system doesn't mean they actually print the money and spend it. That's what the Treasury used to do in the Civil War. But it's a more sophisticated way of doing it. They, they create, they write out checks out of thin air, buy bonds with it, and then the, the checks or the deposits on the Fed then go out into the system, circulate in the system. And I say if anybody wants to redeem their deposits in cash, the print, Fed will print the cash to, to pay back, pay it back, pay it off. So that's the, that's the process. It's equivalent, it's less honest, but equivalent to the old the idea that the Treasury prints money and spends it on missiles or whatever. But that can't go on forever because, because of the interest burden. Well, the interest burden can be, yeah, the interest burden is increased. The interest burden can always be, uh, can always be alleviated, so to speak, by inflation. In other words, the more you inflate, the lower the interest burden becomes. Not if you inflate with credit. They're inflating yeah, with credit. Right. They're not inflating with money. That's, well, well, it's, it's printing I, of money. It's the, the result of credit is money, dollars. Okay, I call money dollars. And uh, dollars is what pays for goods and services. Well, the amount of dollars in circulation are very small compared to the amount of credit. Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know how you pay for, for, for stuff. I pay for stuff by writing out a check, and that's dollars. And, and this, this, check, this check is accepted by my, my people I, buy, I spend money on. That's, that's, I call that money. Thanks. Most people call it money. Murray's point is that this credit can easily be converted yeah. into money. That's the whole idea behind that. Well, I used to scold bankers for being part of this inflation problem. I argued that when they made these loans out of, they fabricated them on the books that uh, that contributed to inflation because it expanded the money supply. Mm -hmm. Their argument was, no, that doesn't expand the money supply because the loans will be paid off. I argued back, no, they don't ever pay them off. They just substitute collateral <coughs> by borrow more money, which is what we've done up to a point. But there comes a point where people can't service the debt any longer. And then the banks, they would like to get some of that money back that they loaned out. And it looks like there's a limitation on how much credit you can extend in a system. And we're somewhere near that. Uh, the credit can continue to expand somewhat. But under the present system, we don't have the capacity to inflate substantially, not like we've done in the past. I mean, we're, we're somewhere I, I, I just don't understand your statement. Israel now has a 900% inflation rate per annum. Yeah, okay. but they don't, they don't do it with credit. They do it with money. They're printing money. You can, you can have unlimited inflation they, they do it with credit, as long as you run currency. I'm sorry. I think it's a, the Bank of Israel buys uh, government bonds to pay the deficit. You do have problems, and we see some domestic banks experiencing them now. When they've granted large loans or increased their loans outstanding over the years, 
in the anticipation that inflation mm. will keep rising and make oh, yeah. the, uh, the debtors able to service the loan debt. Then all of a sudden you get a downturn in the economy and many people can't service their debts. That's what we've seen, for example, with First Chicago, Continental Illinois, and mm. things like that. Um, but Murray's point, of course, is that as long as you don't have that unexpected downturn, banks can keep rolling over their mm -hmm. debt as long as the Federal Reserve is providing no. them the wherewithal no. to do it. Now, I think we all agree there are some upper limits. For example, we saw this hyperinflation mm -hmm. in Germany no. after World War II, and this is what Murray no. and Professor Peden were talking about this morning. The inflation so racks the society, and the controls put on not to get at the root cause of it, but to try and make it uh, the politicians palatable for the citizens to live with, ultimately brings down the society as a major factor. And that is kind of the limit I think you're referring to as well. And I think we all hope and pray that we don't get to that position in the United States and with good dialogue like we've had here today and, and very informative presentations, perhaps we can strengthen the message we need to send so that those events won't occur. Well, I have about 12.15 now, which means we're running a few minutes late, so why don't we adjourn for lunch, and let's assemble back here, oh, about 1.15 this afternoon, or as quickly as we can after 1 o'clock, so we can have our afternoon session. Again, thank you very much.